Now moving to the second part of our um, seminar, or sorry, webinar this morning, I'd like to invite Megan Lilly. Now Megan was the, or is sorry, the Head of Education and Training with AI Group, and certainly our partners in this event. She's going to spend some time with us sharing her insights and what we just heard, uh, which I think was quite, I suppose, broad ranging and, and certainly raised a lot of things perhaps we've heard about, some things that we perhaps didn't quite appreciate as much. Um, to support the discussions with Megan, I've actually got a couple of questions I'm going to throw to her. Um, so we might start with the, the first one and I suppose the obvious one. Your comments, Megan, on the initiatives that um, Minister Cash or Senator Cash has just discussed. So Thanks, Sharon. And, and look, it's great to be part of this webinar. So that's um, the first thank you. Um, and Minister Cash certainly um, ranged through a lot of um, issues and reform, I think, is probably the way of describing it, which, you know, is really important to discuss, but discuss it in the context of manufacturing, which is the focus of what we're doing here today. And um, and so the, the government's got, sort of got two twin, uh, well, two twin strategies, did I say that? Two strategies happening, um, one around modern manufacturing, one about skills, and we're talking about the intersection of them. And they, they actually need to coexist. You can't have one without the other. So they're incredibly important initiatives. Um, and, um, you know, from an AI group employer perspective, um, we're really delighted to see some of the things that came through in the budget, the, the modern manufacturing strategy, but certainly the um, boosting apprenticeship strategy um, or the commencement strategy. So there was the earlier strategy around supporting apprentices um, to keep them in the system, and that's when the pandemic first hit, and that was a really important first step, you know, put the floor in. Um, but we argued very strongly to actually work on as, um, commencements as well, because you know, we're, we're all really conscious that there's a whole lot of people leaving school, you know, more or less now, and that we can't let them just sort of flounder. But we also know that the to, to for the economy and manufacturing to get out of this um, pandemic or to recover from it, um, we will need a really solid supply of skilled labour and we can't afford any disruption to that pipeline. So all of those things kick into that space. There was also the... Um, in the job maker hiring credit, which is yet to come into play, but that's an employment based incentive for employers. So that will sort of be another additional important piece. And, and the minister talked a lot about job trainers, so I won't um, go over that, but you know, obviously incredibly important. And the one that probably doesn't get the attention that it should um, is the, um, the FBT on employer provided retraining and reskilling for redeployed employees. So, so that sort of um, removal of the FBT around that, I think so, something that will also be beneficial to employers. So, um, you know, there are a lot of budget initiatives um, that they really, I mean, I thought the Minister wrote down the word, she talked about it as being a skills-led skills -led recovery. And I, I think that that is the right um, lens to look on, uh, on all of it, including the budget initiatives and the relationship around manufacturing. And without that focus on skills, uh, it would be very difficult to achieve what we need to achieve in the time we need to achieve it. So I think that is absolutely the critical focus. Huge number of things put down. We'll still need to do more work, more reform, but we're in a great place to start all of that. And I, I know, Megan, that AI Group have been doing a lot with um, businesses to help support them through the challenges of the COVID pandemic. pandemic. And I certainly agree, skills-led recovery is certainly something mm -hmm. that seems to be the focus. What are some of the challenges that, that you've heard from businesses that they seem to be facing and that we need to think about going forward? Uh, look, um, there frankly wouldn't be a business in the country that has not been impacted by COVID in one way or another. I mean, I guess it's just the nature of what that impact looks like, whether it's... Um, so, well, you know, some have been um, positive in the sense that they might be in the right place of a supply chain, perhaps providing PPE or, or medical supply equipment or, or whatever, and that, that's sort of fortuitous in a really dire situation. Um, but um, everyone's been impacted, but the impact is variable according to where they are in the economy, where they are in terms of geography, where they are in supply chains and all those sorts of things. We've been surveying our members um, monthly since the pandemic hit, and I guess everyone realised the extent of it, about the impact of it. And, um, you know, some of the things are sort of fairly obvious in terms of um, just the major disruption um, caused by social distancing or, in fact, closure in some situations. So 
those sorts of things. But there's no doubt that um, every company recorded sort of a drop in demand, except those companies I talked about before in that special category. Um, but, but so not only have people experienced a drop in demand, they've simultaneously experienced increased cost in just going about what they used to do previously. So some of that is to do with social distancing uh, or um, number of employee restrictions or, you know, or, or the impact of PPE um, cleaning, all those sorts of things. So, so there, there isn't a company that's running the way it used to run. Everyone's running differently. And I think that that's an important point to understand. Um, and, and so, um, but there's there, one of the upsides, I think that it's important to look at some of the upsides that have come out of this, that is it has actually accelerated our approach to digitalization. So I think companies were variably on that journey in any case. Um, you know, there's a lot of commentary out there and a lot of um, business to business dialogue and all sorts of things about digitalizing supply chains or embarking on your own sort of industry full journey or, or whatever it was in the, each and every circumstance. But the pandemic really pushed the acceleration button on that. And in fact, I think it's the um, McKinsey basically suggests that um, what companies generally take three to four years to do in terms of digitalising themselves, they did do it in about three to four months. And I think that in, in and of itself um, is, is a very interesting thing. Our observation is and our survey of companies say that, you know, when we're more fully out of this pandemic, whenever that will be, and let's hope it's sort of sooner rather than later, says someone living in Melbourne, um, that um, we won't return to where we were before, not only in terms of office type work, but also production based work and other forms of work, but also the interrelationship between companies and how business is conducted and transacted, uh, and including how skills are developed. And so that, so that we are at a point of change around all of those things. Some of the change has been foisted upon us. Um, and now it's up to us to, to grab that change and actually turn it into the most productive, effective, successful way going forward in a way that's inclusive and works for everybody and actually keep the best of it happening and build on it and perhaps challenge some of the other things. But the, uh, you know, returning to where we've been um, isn't really going to be an option. I mean, there's been some structural adjustment in the economy as a result of the pandemic in any case, and certainly in the labour market. And I also think one of the things the National Skills Commission in that data that they released about the 25 emerging occupations, which was actually from 2015 to 2019, so it was pre-pandemic data, but very, very interesting. And one of the things that it clearly identified was the digital deepening that was already occurring in the labour force. So that's been accelerated since then. So I think we've got to grab that and work with that and work with what that means um, in a really constructive, productive way. You've touched on and totally agree, Megan, a, a lot of changes in the way we work, um, evidenced by even today. But the acceleration, digitisation, um, the way we work, um, uh, logistics and various other things, the use of PPE, they, they're all mean different things to the way we work. Um, what does it mean and, and any thoughts that you have in regards to the changes that are needed in knowledge and skills development? Um, yeah, well, I, I actually think that um, whole debate, you know, was a debate and we, we saw a lot of shift in that um, once again pre-pandemic and I, I would be of the view that it's accelerated as a result of it. But um, and if we focus in on manufacturing a bit, so what we're sort of seeing in manufacturing is sort of the machines become the um, sort of producers and people become the value creators. And so I, I think the role of people and skills going forward in this more digitalised version of life and the economy, uh, the, the role of people and skills is as important as it's ever been. So I don't buy into that argument about um, a, a less people-oriented future and, a, and a, you know, more automated, less people. I actually think, but what it does mean is that the jobs that we've had will shift and, and uh, have been shifting as that data from the National Skills Commission has rightly revealed and, and will continue to shift. So what that means is then, then the relationship is sort of between um, knowledge, skills, value creation, all those sorts of things also shifts. And, and I think um, the, there's no doubt that there's a much higher skilled conversation occurring. A lot of the new jobs in manufacturing will be critical, analytical, data-related skills. Um, the importance of those foundation skills and the trade skills will always remain important, but they will work in conjunction 
or in partnership with other skills and other machines in the workplace. So we've got to continue to rethink that. And we've also got to continue to think about how we re revitalise and continuously refresh skills. So the, the speed of reskilling, and I think we probably need to adopt the language of skills deepening, um, will, will be much, um, much shorter. And in fact, some of the companies that I think are quite leading around this would basically identify that they effectively reskill their workforce basically on a two-year cycle. Now, that doesn't mean everything changes. It means building and deepening on from the base they've got. And a lot of that is about the relationship between um, knowledge, skills and application. And, and if you actually then, so I'm jumping around a bit here, sorry about that, but, but if you actually think about it and you think about what, what are some of the, the core underpinning and thinkings about the revised qualification framework, it is the opportunity to reframe those important things so we can actually deliver what's required um, for the whole VET system, but also the manufacturing industry, and keep everyone deeply engaged and deeply skilled in new, in, in the current ways, but new ways, and in an ongoing way. And a lot of that will be much more conceptual, critical, analytical, building on the technical. It's your turn to be on mute. I don't know how I did that. Um, sorry about that. Um, certainly touch on some of the opportunities there. Um, certainly the job shifting and, and people being the value creators. I certainly agree with that. But for those of us actually building those skills, whether it's employers or people doing the, um, the training development, what will help us build the right skills for, for industry and individual enterprises? Well, I mean, ultimately industry and individual enterprises need to own that answer. Um, but I, I think the best way to own it, because, because they're the ones who will have the need and, and that's got to drive it. But, um, but, the, but the best way to get to that answer is to do it in partnership, whether it's with, or it should be with the training providers and, and, you know, all of the players in the equation, industry associations, unions, the lot. We all need to be part of this solution and, and, um, and bring different solutions to the table. So we don't need a one-size-fits-all. We, we need many more flexible solutions. We need a much more adaptive system so that we can plug things in and out more quickly. That leads you to the micro-credential discussion. I don't think I've had a discussion this year about any VET reform without talking about micro-credentials. I actually think it's become a label for shorter credentials. Um, that doesn't replace the importance of qualifications, but it, it, what it's saying is the mix needs to change. The other thing I think we need to do is look at collaborative partnerships, and that is looking at sort of, you know, innovation hubs, industry hubs, there's examples around now, but there's many, many more. I, I can't believe how many conversations I have around that sort of stuff. And so these are about skills-based innovation, collaborative hubs, often that occur outside training providers that so might occur in an industry park. One we're talking about is, is a um, local government initiative around industry four and a business precinct, all these sorts of things that all of the players come to the table, they collaborate. It's a continuous ongoing conversation to, con to address exactly what you're talking about is who needs to know what is it and how do we get there? And there is no answer that can just sort of land from above. Everyone's got to be in that journey of creating the answer, but it's absolutely got to be focused around real work, real jobs now and going forward. So think forward's not back. Um, build on that. Sometimes that'll be a bit of a leap of faith. Sometimes we've got to be a bit brave what that might look for. We need flexible solutions around all of that so that so that it can be shorter and sharper and really meet those needs. We need to excite young people to come into this place to see a really great future around all of this so they can identify their future in amongst all of this stuff. Um, uh, because manufacturing is absolutely already a core and critical part of the economy, but we see the revitalisation of manufacturing driven by skills as being even more important than it already is now. Couldn't agree more, Megan. But un unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, and I think we could all keep the conversation going for a lot longer. But, but I'll, I'm conscious that you probably have other things you need to get to. So thank you, Megan. And, and certainly agree, skills to enable real jobs and real work is certainly what we need to focus on. Um, just in conclusion, as you've heard, the government's various initiatives and budget commitments are far reaching and impressive. This is a really important time for manufacturing in Australia. We have a federal government that is driving a top down approach 
with important support to both manufacturing and skills development. IPSA Group um, is further responding to this and is going to be kicking off a series of webinars on this important topic to continue to drive those conversations so that we can help inform governments and industries to deliver those necessary jobs and skills that are needed. To be part of this, we'll be reaching out to you to register your interest. Finally, none of this would be possible without all of those in attendance today. Thank you all for making the time to join this event today. Have a good day and um, we'll speak to you all soon.